chapter 11. I trust that you read over chapter 10 last week. We'll mi- I highlight a couple things here as we go through it. Um, we had a, um, a great week of studying God's Word. James on Thursday night. Uh, we now have it up where you can watch it online if you missed that. And this morning we're in Acts chapter 16 studying how, taking a look at this wonderful young gal who was demon possessed, who was making money for her fortune tellers, the mafia there, and how God set her free. You know, God's still in the business of setting people free, healing people's lives. I'm so thankful that for that, that God intervened in my life many, many years ago where I came to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Who would think that God would take a renegade, a, a, a somebody that was a knucklehead and doing what I live in the lifestyle I was doing and allow me to teach his word? I, I still can't, I pinch myself that I get to do this. But here we go. And, and sometimes you look at a book like Job and you go, why is this in the Bible? They're arguing amongst themselves. They're, they're trying to solve things, but yet, isn't it there really for our understanding? Because it really shows people who, where they really are, how they deal with problems, and how they have difficulties with issues that come up. And we're going to see a few more of them. Of course, we have three men that come there to try to dispute the words of Job. They try to uh, really confront him, uh, really, as they really feel that there's some hidden sin in Job's life. So all this problem has come to their life, and they keep bringing it up over and over again. Of course, they don't know the whole story. They don't know everything that has happened. And even though by observation they could see the disaster that has happened in their life, but they don't know. And so now we get this next fellow who comes into the scene named Zophar a Nithothite. And he said in verse 2, Should not the multitudes of the words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should thy laws make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, my doctrine is pure, and I'm cl- I am clean in thine eyes. And now Job did not say up to this point that his doctrine is pure, has he? He hasn't said everything. He hasn't talked about his doctrine. He declared he didn't know what was why this had happened to him. He, didn't, he had no real understanding why all this catastrophe had come to them. But Zophar here is now challenging him, even at the core of his beliefs and the things that he was standing on in verse 5. But oh, that God would speak and open up his lips against thee, that he would, uh, would show thee the secret of wisdom, that they are double to which uh, that which is. Now know therefore that God exacts of thee less than thine iniquity deserves. He says, Job, you really only have half of what you should really deserve. That's kind of, what kind of friend, right? You know, here he's standing in judge, a jury and judge of the whole situation. He says, man, you should have more that can come upon him. But, you know, I, one thing I do know is that we don't deserve half of what God has given us. God has given us his mercy. David, in his writing of the mercies of God, says, As nigh as the heavens are above the earth, so high is thy mercy towards us. For you have not punished us according to to us, or you have not rewarded us according to our iniquity. God hasn't rewarded us. God hasn't given to us according to our standards of living, how good we've been or how bad we've been. He's given it to us because he loves us. And that's the part they don't understand. God has shown us his grace towards us. God has shown his mercy towards us. I think that only a fool would say to God, Lord, give me what I deserve. Give me what I deserve. That would be the fool. And so in verse 7, very important, as we read here, can thou by searching find out God? Can thou find out the almighty unto perfection? Can any man... Really, it's a rhetorical question, of course. The answer is no. Can you search? Can you understand the mind of God? Being that God is infinite and we're finite, we have limitation. Can we understand everything that happens to us, the whys and the wherefores, everything that has? We have a little bit of struggle with that because we only see things in part. 
As, we, as it tells us in verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we only know in part, we only see in part. You could begin a mental quest to understand and to know God, but apart from God's revelation of himself to us, as he's revealed himself through God's word, that he doesn't contrary in any other part as his revelation to us, there's no way that man can know him. He re, we know him as he reveals himself to us. It's not, a, it's not a mental quest. Impossible. God said, my ways are not your ways. My ways are beyond what you're finding out. And so the answer is, can I just search God? I could find all the answer if I could just, by searching, find out God. The answer, of course, is no. In verse 8, he says, it is as high as heaven. What canest thou do? Deeper than hell, what canest thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Talking about the knowledge and the capacity of God. Isn't it, is it kind of interesting how Paul kind of picks this up and out of the book of Ephesians as he talks about God's grace to us? He says that God would grant, uh, grant you according to the riches of his glory to, to be strengthened by might by the Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the knowledge, and the height, and to know the love of God, that what? That passes knowledge. And so if you want to know as much as you can know, know Christ. He says that's where you're really going to know what life's all about and everything that, they, that we can know. The love of Christ passes knowledge. It's more than man can know. In verse 10, if he cut, if he cut off and shut, and shut up and gather together, then who can hinder him? Really, he's really speaking about the sovereignty of God. Who could stay the hand of God? Who could stop the purposes of God? We were talking about this this week, about you know, I, I've been getting in the mail, probably like you two, have been getting all these things about the upcoming elections and everything that, you know, vote for me, vote for me, vote for me, things that I get them and I try to uh, figure them out, but it's hard, right? You know, but ultimately, our election, our nation belongs in the hand of God. And we as Christians, we need to pray and seek God's wisdom and how we're going to move forward and proceed as a nation. You know, as we can gather information provided for the church, we will. And what we stand on issues. But really, it's God who's sovereign. And God has made a plan for this world. And his plan is that he's coming back. He's made a plan for the nation of Israel. We see it happening right before our hands. Nobody can stop that from happening. I'm sorry, the rest of the world. You need to wake up to the fact that God still has a plan for the nation of Israel and nobody's going to stop that. And in verse 11, for he knoweth vain man, he, he seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For, for vain man would be wise and though be born like a wild ass colt, if thou prepares thine heart and stretch out thy hands towards him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away and let that wickedness dwell in thy tabernacle. So again, he's saying to Job, he says, look, if you stretch out your hands to God and forsake your iniquity, God's going to know you. He's going to restore your life back to him. And, and so he's making this assumption that Job hasn't repented of his sin. You know, and, and again, that's not his place to be doing this. It's to be saying, as that Job, we see you sitting over there. Over there, we could see your home being destroyed, your family being destroyed. We could see all your livestock's been wiped out. Obviously, it's sin in your life. And he says, if you just repent, if you just would come clean, you can get on with your life. In verse 15, for then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot, yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear, because thou shalt for, uh, forget thy misery and remember it as waters that pass away. And thy age shall be clearer than the noonday, and thou shalt shine forth, uh, thou shalt, shalt be as the morning. And, and a lot of what he's saying is true. If we do these things, God does restore. 
God takes away the sin that we, uh, you know, we, we're involved with and how he's able to take that which robbed our life and restore and make things right as a man or woman would repent before the Lord. Because the Bible tells us when we come to Christ, we're what? We're, what? we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. All things, all our former things have been done away. And that was the case where he is. You know, over in the previous chapter, chapter 10, Job and his complaint in verse 21 said, Behold, I go where I, I do not return, for where I do not return, even to the land of darkness. Job's in a place of darkness, of really of no hope. And this guy goes on in verse 18, And thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest and safety. Otherwise, you, if you put a moat around you, you're going to be in a place of safety. And thou, and thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall be, uh, make suit unto thee. But, thy eye, but the eyes of the wicked shall fail, and they shall not escape, and there's no hope shall be given, uh, uh, given up the ghost. You know, he was doing pretty good up to that last verse. Again, he's making that accusation that Job, he says, because of your wickedness, if you don't repent, you're, when you give up the ghost, your life is not going to be good. And so Job answers in chapter 12, no doubt, but, but you are the people. And wisdom shall die with you. <laughs> Maybe you met some of these people when they come on the scene and they, they come along and they think they're the, I, I'm the all God sent to you. I'm the Bible answer man. And they come across like that. I got, I'm going to solve your problem. Just sit down and have a, let me, let's have a cup of coffee and I'll tell you all about your problems. And be aware of those people. Verse 3, he says, but I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. Good for Job saying, I'm, no, I'm not, you know, you think you're uh, better than me, that you're more high and mighty. But the Bible tells us that what? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are in the same boat. He says, yeah, you know not, not such things as these. I I am as one mocked of his neighbor who calleth upon God. He answers him, the just, uh, just upright man is laughed to scorn. He is ready to slip with his feet as a lamp despised in the, uh, in the thought of him that is at ease. It's easy for a fellow who isn't having the problem to have all the answers. You know, when you're looking on the outside, on the outside, I'll solve your problem. It's easy that way. And this guy's Job saying it. And in verse 6, the tabernacles of the ro robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hands God bringeth abundantly. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach, you, teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the sea, they shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not all these things that, are, that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? And whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Every one of us have the, we're in the same place as the fish of the sea, of the beasts. We all are dependent upon God for our very breath. Do you remember that fantastic story? I love the stories in the book of Daniel. I love the prophecies of the book of Daniel. I just love reading Daniel. And in there in chapter 5 where Belshazzar, you remember that Babylonian king? He was kind of a wild young king, and he decided to have a, a, a really a party for all of his lords as he invited them all over there. As they all gathered together, he, he, he says, you know what, let's go ahead and you know, have a toast to our gods. Bring all those vessels. That, remember when my grandfather Nebuchadnezzar went down to Jerusalem, they went into that temple, and they gathered all those golden vessels. Bring those things on up here, and let's worship the God, God of so, silver and, and gold. Let's lift up our you know, gauntlets unto them and worship them. And as he was drinking those, and he's after, you know, really having that party type of, you know, can you, I, I just pictured, it just gets me, and all of a sudden as they were just worshiping, this hand comes out. 
And it just writes across the wall. Talk about something that would sober people up very quickly as he writes a meeny, meeny, tekel of Farsi. What in the world is that all about? And so, of course, he wanted to know, and I love it, where it tells us that as he, that he saw that thing, he says that Belshazzar's knees started smote one next to another. They came on loose. He, he knew things were bad. And he looked for people to be able to interpret it. Of course, they couldn't find anybody. And finally, the queen's mother said, says, In the days of your father's reign, there was a man of the Hebrew who was skilled in interpreting dreams and all. And he could probably tell you what it says. So, so they called Daniel, and they came, he came on the scene. And, bef and he, before he interpreted the writing to Belshazzar, he said, When you were small and nothing in your eyes, God gave to you great, uh, this great kingdom of your father, grandfather Nebuchadnezzar. He had learned that God reigned over the nations of your world. Now you have brought in the vessels of gold and silver, and you praise the gods of gold and silver. But it is God's whose hand your very breath is. You have not glorified here. You have not glorified God, and so this is what Job. What we get for Job, he says, the breath of every living things is in the hands of God. Here's this king that was ruling the largest province and empire in the world at that time. He was El, El, the most powerful person there was. And all of a sudden, you know the story, right? That breath was held right in his hand, and God took him. It wasn't very long before he was gone out of the scene. As you go on, and as you take a look at it, I, I depend upon God for my breath. We all depend on God's hand. As he goes on in verse 11, he's talking about the sovereignty of God. Does not the ear try words and your mouth taste his meat? You, with wisdom, uh, ancient is wisdom and length of days understanding. With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Behold, he break it down. It cannot be built again. He shut it up. A man and there cannot, uh, can, uh, there can be no opening. And when you look at history, the history of what has happened, how many cities were knocked down by God and no longer exist. They're still looking for a couple of cities. Remember during the time of Noah and the time of well, Abraham with Lot? Remember those cities? What were their names? Abraham, uh, Sodom? And what was the other one? <laughs> when God knocks them down, they're no longer around, are they? He could take care of things. Behold, he withhold the waters, and then they dry up, and he sendeth them out, and they overturn them. He withhold the waters where? When Moses and the nation, when they were escaping Egypt, and they were going across that river Niles, he says, God could stop that water. With him is strength and wisdom. Notice, with who? With God is strength, is wisdom. On Thursday night, we talked about wisdom. He says, where can we find the wisdom of God? The Bible tells us all we need to do is ask of God and he'll give to each and every one of us liberally. He abradeth not, he'll give it to us. And here Job, so many years ago, is saying with him is strength and wisdom. And the deceive and deceivers are his. The, he leads counselors away spoiled and make a judges fools. He looses the bonds, bonds of kings and girdeth the loins with girdles. Uh, and he leadeth princes away spoiled and overthrow the mighty. And he removes his speeches. And you can go right on through the rest of it. Speak it about the sovereignty of God over his creation, over nature. He observes floods. He does everything. And I'm sure during this time where Job was at, for the best part we could tell, he was over in the area where Abram was from before he was Abraham. Over there around the area of the Tigers, Euphrates, where they were overflow their banks. And so this reference that we see it here, he says, God's the one that has it, the, the floods, the, where they overflow the banks and then they, they recede. And you know something? That still happens today. <clears throat> Last year, Miss and I were in uh, Omaha for a pastor's conference that I was speaking at. And you had the great Missouri River there. And all the farmers, they couldn't farm anymore. Because that Missouri River so overfilled the banks, over flooded they, that whole valley, a bunch of highways that we, you normally could go across, freeways that we would put on, were completely stopped because the water overflowed the bank. 
God is still in control even this day. God rules not only during this time, <clears throat> but he rules today. Verse chapter 13, verse 1. Lo, my eyes have seen all this, Job is saying. My ears have heard and, and understood it. What ye know, the same do. And do I also, I know also. Speaking of his friends or these counselors, I'm not inferior to you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to reason with God, but you, but you, but ye are forgers of lies. You are all physicians of no value. Well, that's a, that's a statement, right? You're all doctors, but really you're you don't know how to doctor. All that ye would all together hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Otherwise, better keep your mouth shut and let people think that you're full, then to open it and remove all doubt. We've heard that before, right? From our old pastor. If you guys would just keep your mouth shut, you'd be wiser, what he's saying. And then he goes on, he says, Hear now my reasoning, and hearken to the pleading of my lips. Will you speak wickedly for God, and talk deceitfully for him? That's an interesting question. A question that we should take serious, but especially people who are want to speak, I call it weird doctrine, false doctrine. Paul calls them in the, in the New Testament, in the epistles, he calls them doctrine of demons. Their teachings, what it really means, your philosophy of life, what you're, what you're sharing. He says, the things that take us away from our, the really our true understanding of who God is and take us away from Jesus Christ. Doctrines that really come from the friends of Job. They were really what they were saying. They were trying to bring him to a, conf a positive confession. If you just would confess you'd be all right. If you just confess your sin, you'll be okay. They're trying to, you know, you know say that this is what, how you get healed. If you just simply confess this and repent, then everything's going to be okay. But you know something? I found out good godly people get sick. Good godly people end up getting cancer, and it breaks my heart when they do. And, and people, good friends of ours here at Agape Chapel have died. And that breaks my heart. I don't believe in those false doctrines that are out there that they're sharing with them because it does not represent God correctly. And I say woe unto them that are saying that. As James talks about it, he says you wouldn't want to, or Jesus said, you wouldn't want to be one of these people because he says it's better that a millstone was wrapped around your neck and you'd be cast into the sea. And if, when you go over to Israel with me, I'll take you and show you that millstone I believe Jesus was talking about. It's still sitting there. And you could see the Gal see a Galilee that he was talking about. Jesus was serious. When you get up to represent Jesus Christ and God to people, that you don't misrepresent him. It's shameful to see that pastors are flying around in first class and staying in the most fanciest hotels and thinking that they're above people. That isn't what God's all about. Jesus, take a look the way we studied today, the way Paul and Silas lived their lives. How they were servants. May God help us to examine ourselves that we represent the Lord well. In verse 8, Job, I think, was fed up with these guys. Will you accept his person? Will you contend for God? Are you going to actually contend for God? Is it good that he should search you out as one that one mocketh another? Do you so mock God, mock him? He will surely reprove you if you do secretly accept persons. It's interesting, when we get to the end, when we get to the middle, the end of the story, really, as Job is finally talking with God, and he talks about his guys, he says, now you would be better if you repent. And God said to these guys, boys, you're in serious trouble. As we get further along in the book, verse 11, shall not his excellence, excellency make you afraid and his dread fall upon you? You know, I fear God. His wonder, his power, his truth. And I think that's what he's saying. He says, his, his, don't you guys know his excellency? And doesn't that make you afraid? And afraid in the sense that you don't want to misrepresent him? He's so precious. He's so wonderful. And in verse 13, he says, hold your peace. Let me alone that I may speak and let, let, come me, uh, let it come on me what will. 
Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? Though, though he slay me, and I love this, though he slay me, who slays me? Though God slays me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain my own ways or my own integrity before him. If God's going to take me out, let him take me out. If God slays me, I'm going to still trust him. No matter what life brings me, no matter what curves are ahead of me, what path comes to me, I'm not going to sway for my faith in Jesus Christ. And Job said, I'm not going to sway. I'm not going to move off the mark from trusting God. He says, it's going to be okay. He's also, he also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Hear diligently my speak, speech and my declaration with your ears. Behold, now I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. So Job here is maintaining his innocence before all these things. Who is he that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, I shall give up the ghost. Only do not do, do not two things unto me, then will I not hide myself from thee. And so now Job, and starting in verse 19, is shifting his conversation to God. He said, he's really saying, God, I want to talk to you. I want to have, find out. I want to talk this over with you. And yeah, I think it's good that we learn from this is that Job was one to talk with the Lord even when he was troubled. So, so often we feel like when we can come to God is only when we're feeling good. The only time I can really praise is when I praise the Lord's when I read 10 chapters of the day. I got to make sure everything's good. But never lose sight that God's our best friend. He wants to hear our good days, our bad days, our complaints, everything else. Even as a good friend would want to reason with you as the Lord says, come on now, sit down, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet. The Lord wants us to come to him. And then one of the things that he asked of God in verse 21, <clears throat> he says, Withdraw thine hand far, far from me, and let not the, thy dread be upon me. Otherwise, Lord, could you slow it down on me? Don't bring so much, I don't need any more hard times. I've had enough that has fallen upon me. Then call thou, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. How, how, many, how many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Otherwise, examine my heart. In Psalm 51, David prayed pretty much the same prayer. He says, if there's iniquity within me, he says, David declared, and this is really the repentive psalm after David had sinned with Bathsheba. He says, thou desires truth, David did, and truth in the inward being. He says, God, you want more than just my lip service to you? You know, I could talk to my friends, and if they ask me how I'm doing, I always will say I'm doing fine. But God knows different. He says, God, you, you want to know my heart. And Job is saying, how many are my iniquities? I want to know these things. Verse 24, wherefore hidest thou thy face and holdest me from thine enemy? Wilt thou break a leaf <laughs> driven to and fro? And wilt thou pursue thy dry stubble? For thou writest bitter things against me and making me possess iniquity of my youth. Job is saying, is there something I did as a, as a kid? Is there something I did that in my past that brought on all my troubles? If that's the case, I think all of us would, wanna, would have to line up you know, for the troubles that we might have had. David prayed. He says, remember not the sins of my youth. I pray that. My rebellious times and the things that I made in my own life. But Job goes back, he says, Lord, if there's something that I did as a child, if there's anything, he says, examine my whole life. If there's anything that I've done wrong, I want to know. I want to come clean. Thou puttest my feet in the stock and lookest narrowly unto, thy pa uh, unto all my past. Otherwise, examine me thoroughly. And thou settest a print upon the heels of, the, of my feet. And he, and he as the rotten thing consume in the garment that is moth-eaten. And so now, after he finishes, notice in verse 1, 
He's man that is born of a woman is full is a few days and full of troubles. <laughs> He's you know a lot of that could be said is fairly true that it seems like they're few days. You think about the birthday party of this fellow Methuselah when he hit 965 birthdays. What do you think he would have said? He said, boy, didn't life go by fast? I, there's so many other things I would want to get done and would want to get accomplished. And Job said, few are the days that we have and they just zip on by. Uh, today I was talking to Dan out of uh, first our uh, second service out of Poema, and he said, "Terry, we got to sit down and we got to spend some time pl planning Easter and our Good Friday services out there in the field." I go, "Wait a second, I just put away the Christmas stuff. Hang on a second, give me another week or two. How quickly the days go by." Job, when he had come down to meet Pharaoh, the father of Joseph, and he, he brought, brought in the, and introduced him to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, how are you, sir? And he said, the days of my pilgrims, uh, pilgrimage are, have been 165 years. Few and evil have been my days. 165 years old, few and evil, much like so many of us have felt in our lives how quickly to go by. In verse 2, he cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continues not. And of course, we see this in the Psalms and Paul writes about it, about how quickly the grass, the, as the field shoots up and the sun hits it, it's scorched and then it withers away. Again, a reference of the shortness of life, how quickly it, the flowers, the blooms, of wildflowers come up, like James says, like a vapor that appears for a moment and then disappears. In verse 3, and, the, and thou, thou open thy eyes upon such as one, and bringest me into judgment with thee. Who can bring a clean thing out of the unclean? No one. So sad. A false statement there. Because there is one person. The person is Jesus Christ and him only. Do you know because of the work of Calvary? And this is the one that part that just thrills me. That God sees you clean. Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we stand before God even this day as spotless. Because God has imputed his, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is imputed upon all of us. And so as he sees his children, he sees them as, wow, these are my kids. My goodness, my kids, I could never find fault with them. How pure and beautiful that they were. Especially when they were playing, my son was playing Little League. I mean, my, my wife said, Terry, you might want to slow down a little bit because I was backstage I know when I was the coach and all that. The only eyes I could see, look at my son. I know he's going to play in the majors one day because he couldn't do anything wrong. How much does our Heavenly Father look at your life in the eyes of love? How much he cares about you? He says, seeing his days are determined, in verse 5, the number of his months are thee, and thou hast appointed his bounds uh, that he cannot pass. What he's saying, he says, it's, we all been appointed for a man once to die. After that, the judgment, there's a limit to how long we live. In verse 6, he says, turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish, accomplish as his hireling his days. For there is hope of a tree. It will be cut down that will sprout out again and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof be wax old of the earth and the stalks thereof die in the ground, yet though, though the scent of water it will bud or through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth a bow like a plant. You cut down a tree in your backyard, you leave the roots there, what he's saying. You give it some time, so water's going to come up. What do you see? You see it start sprouting out once again. But if a man dieth and wastes away, yea, a man gives up and goes, where is he? That's the question that he keeps asking himself. What happens after death? That's a real question for many people. And I think a lot of people, especially in our society, tries to drown it out. They don't really want to face the reality of death. 
They don't want to think about what happens at that moment after you die. Is there life after death is really what we're looking at here, isn't there? Is, is there life after death? And I want to tell you before we finish here tonight, that there's a surety there is life after death. But Job is wondering this. As the waters fail from the sea and the flood, they, uh, they crieth and drieth up. A so man lie down and rises not till the heavens be till the heavens be no more. They shall not wake nor rise out of his sleep. Long after the universe flickers and dies, man will remain in a sleep. Man dies and he wastes away. His spirit leaves his body, but where does it go? O Job, verse thirteen. Oh, that thou would hidest me in the grave, that thou would keep me, uh, uh, would keep me secret until thy wrath be past, that thou would appoint me a set time and remember me. Here we have all the way back in Job, and those who study Bible prophecies like to look at verse 13 as being that hint of the wrath of God that's going to come. Our ladies at Agape Chapel on Saturdays, uh, they meet twice a month, they started studying the book of Revelation. And in the re book of Revelation, they were telling me that they kind of outlined the bo whole book yesterday, and I had to plot them for that. That's difficult to do in itself. But they were telling me, it started in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation, and all the way to chapter 18, it speaks about the wrath of God that's going to be poured out upon this earth for all those who, who have done wickedly, who have re rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. From the fall of man all the way to now, all that wickedness will be de dealt with. And so Job is saying, hey, when that wickedness comes, would you please just hide me someplace so that I don't have to see it, I don't have to deal with it? Oh, Job, you will not be worried about that. We're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Do you know when the wrath of God's going to come? It tells us here in the scriptures, the way we understand the scriptures, it happens, I think, very soon. It could happen three and a half years from now. If the rapture of the church would happen this day or this night, and I'm not prophesying it is going to happen because no man knows the day or the hour. Three and a half years from that day of the rapture of the church, it says that God's wrath is going to start for three and a half years and, and that what's going to really trigger it during that day, that time where the Antichrist is going to sit upon that throne and declare himself to be God and demand to be worship, and that's going to pour out the wrath of God upon this earth. Where is the believers? The Bible tells us that we won't be here. We're to be raptured up, and we're to be in the presence of the Lord, what is called a marriage feast of the lambs. Hallelujah. Amen. I can't get excited about that. I, can't, I don't know what else I could be excited about. And one day we will return to this earth. It tells us when Jesus Christ comes back riding with, on his horse with 10,000 of his saints and that glorious reign where he sets up his reign upon this earth for a thousand years and we'll reign with him. Oh Job, don't worry about hiding underneath a rock. In verse 14, great question. If a, man, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. If I could just believe this, if I, could, if I just had this hope within me, if a man dies, will I live again? We're going to pick up the rest of this, but I want to leave you with this question in our heart. That lies, as I mentioned, in deep in the heart of all of us. The question that surfaces up and, you know, I don't care who they are, the rock and roll star, the movie star, you know, the politician, anybody, our milkman and whoever comes around. In fact, I don't even know if we have milkman coming around anymore. But, but everybody deals with that. If I die, will I live again? One thing that I find as we get further along, and let me tell you, but Job does have his faith where he believes on the Lord. As we get, get further along, along in the book of Job, in chapter 19 and verse 25, he says, For I know, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and he, that he shall stand at the la latter day upon the earth. And though my, after my skin worms are destroyed, and my body, up my flesh, shall I seek God, I shall see God, whom shall I see my, before my face, and I will see him. Tremendous hope.
that Job has. In despair, he did not have it. When a man dies, will he live? Jesus addressed that problem. Jesus answered that problem. As, he, as he's declared, he says, I am what the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though they were dead, yet shall he live. And he who lives and believes in me shall what? Never, never, never die. Yes, Job, there is hope. There's a hope because of Calvary. There's a hope because Jesus Christ died on the cross to give us that access to forgiveness, to give us where we stand clean before, before God who took that shed blood of Jesus Christ in order for us to do that. But three days later, as we hear, see in the scriptures that he rose from the dead that we might experience this newness of life and he left the captives free. He led Job and Abraham and everybody else who is waiting for that resurrection. And one day, there's going to be a glorious celebration around that throne as we continue along in Job. We're going to continue along talking about it, even in verse 22. But his flesh upon him shall have pain, and the soul within him shall mourn. Yeah, Job's going to have a little bit more pain, a little bit more mourning. But there is hope in the resurrection because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This week, one thing I can encourage you is that you can have that faith in Jesus. Not only for your week, day by day, he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, as we saw this morning. Even if you go into prison, like Paul and Silas did here this morning, and they're being, after being beaten, after being whipped and everything else, they could experience Christ in the middle of their time there in prison. Do you know they were there for quite a long time before midnight rolled around? They were beaten during the midtime, during the day, after having their backs whipped wide open. They were beaten with canes. For sharing the gospel, it tells us about midnight, they started worshiping and praising their God. No matter what you're going on, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we too can worship and praise the Lord. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer and then Ray finish this off in a song. Father, we thank you this evening. Thank you for this glorious story of a man's struggle. The questions that are real, the questions that... He's seeking to know. Lord, as he's seen so much disasters in his life, he's experienced so much good in his life also. Deep down, he just wants to know you and experience you like we all do. Because we know that this life is short. It's going by so quickly. Help us to live for you. And we long for that day when we're before your throne, worshiping our King day by day by day. And Lord, we long for that day. We pray that as we march forward, that we would march forward with our hearts on flame for you, in love with you, Jesus. And that would bubble over as we share your love with other people this week. And that we might be encouraged. And I just pray if any of us are struggling, any of us are hurting, not only physically, spiritually, maybe discouraged, that we would all be encouraged that the great God of all gods is for us and that we would rest in that and we go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if anybody walked in here lacking, may they just feel that fresh work of your Holy Spirit come upon them even right now. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all stand? I'm in.